Hey everyone, welcome to the Guitar Origins Podcast, powered by AIMusicLessons.com, the site that teaches you guitar. I'm your host, Greg Burlett, and I'm talking with pro guitarists about their journey with guitar. Today, I'll be speaking with John Hagley. He's a Canadian guitarist, producer, and composer for video games, TV, and film. He's written music for PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch games, recorded guitar on DreamWorks' Dragons, and his music is on a lot of commercials that you've probably seen before. Mercedes, Visa, Ford, Lincoln, Kraft. Yes, like Kraft Dinner. And with that background, he has a really unique perspective on guitar. So let's go. AI Music Lessons presents John Hagley. So you have a pretty extensive resume of things that you touch and work on, uh, which is really, really cool. So right off the bat, what I want to ask you, what I'm dying to ask you is, how the heck did you get into that? Right. So um, I started playing guitar when I was 12. Uh, that was like my first entry into music. And my dad always was like obsessed with music. Um, but then I decided to study music, um, formally. So I went to York university, uh, for the jazz guitar program and, cool. um, York university's music program is just absolutely massive. So I actually didn't stay strictly in the jazz stream for the entire time. Cool. Um, what, what is it about, about academics and jazz? Like why, why does every guitar program that you might look at, uh, in secondary education, why is it all jazz? Yeah, I guess um, I guess jazz just has this long history, and when you dissect it, it is very complex. So, like, if you know how to work through jazz harmony, you're kind of like set up for success, kind of. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, it's either you either do jazz or classical, right? Um, okay. Classical is just uh, that. Obviously, has a huge long history as well. Um, very different though, but I, I guess, I mean, there are some schools in the States. Um, I think like maybe a musicians Institute, they still teach you some jazz, but that's way more contemporary oriented. Right. But as far as I know, there's nothing like that in Canada. We need, we need a school of rock, John. We yeah, need, we, we need, uh, we need Jack Black to come over here. We need, you know what we need? We need Chad Kroger from Nickelback and he needs Absolutely. to put on a school of rock. <laughs> And just yeah. teach us those power chords, those sweet, yes. sweet power chords. And how he does that amazing <laughs> voice. <laughs> Never again. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Cool. So uh, York University, yes. you're taking jazz courses. Right. So um, then I kind of like, I branched off and studied orchestration. Um, and I also studied like digital electronic music. And then they had this one film composition class. Just one. Um, and I took that and I just really liked it. And, um, since I've always been obsessed with like multiple genres, uh, learning so many different things about music, like I always wanted to be very versatile. So writing music for media seemed to be like a pretty obvious application of that. Right. Yeah. There's so many different <clears throat> emotions that, that you need to work with and, and evoke, right? When, yeah. when you're writing for, especially for film, because film is super varied. Like you could, you could be writing for, um, uh, kind of like a thriller and everything's staccato, like really fast notes yeah. and then moving to, uh, like a love story or something like that where yeah. everything's like really smooth, smooth jazz, straight up smooth jazz. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, I end up, I, yeah. So I took that, I took that one, that one class. And I loved it so much. I ended up going to uh, Chicago for my master's. So I did a uh, master's in, and that was specifically um, music composition for the screen. And that was at cool. Columbia College, Chicago. So that's where I really like dove in and uh, just really focused mainly on composition. So um, do you feel like um, getting into that, that field where, where you're composing and, you know, writing music for guitar, do you feel like it's necessary for you to have 
uh, higher education to get into that field? Um, like in terms of credibility or, yeah. or can you just be someone that writes a whole bunch of songs, puts them up on SoundCloud and starts distributing them to people and then people will take notice and, and kind of take you seriously? Right. So it's absolutely possible to do what I do without higher education. Um, it's just going to look how you get there is just going to look a lot different. Um, right. For me personally, it worked out really well for me. Like, like going to school is, it's not like necessarily a shortcut, but I mean, all my professors were like industry established, right? right. So they already kind of like usher you in. Like, for example, with internships, like my, uh, the director of the program in Chicago was just very well connected in LA. He's a film composer himself and um, like an established film composer himself. And so when it came time for internships, he was calling people he's known for a while, who he's met That's at awesome. LA parties for a while. You know what I mean? So it's kind so of... So you're not only getting the skills that you need, but you're also kind of tapping into the industry network. Uh, yeah. of people which is really sweet yeah and you can yeah. you can do it on your own if you're crafty you just you gotta have the the type of personality to really take control of your own um learning i mean it's the same with learning an instrument honestly i mean like people always ask like do i need to take formal lessons and be like you don't have to um you know but the the people that are successful without getting any formal education they seem to be a s specific type of person you know um, you just have to be really hungry for it. Totally. Um, there, there's so many different ways to learn guitar or, or any instrument. And, and ultimately just like anything in life, you get out of it, what you put in. Yeah. Right. And, um, some people really prescribe to the belief that, you know, I, I need a one-on-one -on -one mentor, uh, and I need someone to keep me accountable and other people, um, are, are like YouTube learners and just kind of pick up little, little morsels of, of knowledge from all these different, different parts. Um, and a lot of people hate that because it's too chaotic right. and like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be learning next. Um, and that's something that, that, that we've thought a lot about, um, my current project at, at AI yeah, music lessons, we're thinking about, you know, we have, we have all of these, these lessons and, and fundamentals and skills that we want to teach people, but how do we actually lay them out in a way that, that makes sense uh, uh, across a whole learning journey, right? And it's, right. it's really hard. Um, and it's even hard for, for in-person lessons it's, if you're doing things on your own. Um, at the end of the day, you just have to find something that works for you and, and stick with it, I think yeah. is the, the main message there. Consistency is super important. You, you just have to get there out there and do it. Yeah. You just have to go out there and meet people, meet, in my case, go out and meet directors, meet music supervisors, all that kind of thing. Just your face out there. Yeah. Thinking about um, kind of movies and, and commercials and, and making those contacts. Have you heard the term, uh, your network is your net worth? And do you, <laughs> do you believe in that? Uh, I've, I haven't heard that before, but it, it makes sense. I mean, networking is this thing in the creative industry that's like uh like people hate networking or they they hate the concept of having to network right it's it's just this weird like irky thing that no one really likes to do or admit that they have to do but it it is pretty important i mean i mean the whole way i got into doing music for ads was just because i knew a guy like you know cool. so like in most of the time, the way that ad music works is that there's these, uh, these um, like audio music production houses. And okay. usually they have a list of freelancers that they call when they need music for an advertisement. Um, there are very, very, very few in-house composer positions anymore. Um, there was, there is this one company that I used to work for that did have in-house composer positions. And so when I got back from school, from um, my internship in LA, I joined the Screen Composers Guild of Canada. Okay. Um, it's similar to the Society of Composers and Lyricists in the States. Um, so I ended up meeting this friend at this um, orchestral recording session. And we both lived uh, in the same, we both lived in Oakville at the time. 
um, which is a little bit west of Toronto. Um, and so we just became friends. And then, you know, a year later, he gets hired as an in-house composer at this company. And then fast forward like two years after that. And unfortunately, one of the in-house composers actually passed away. And so there was an opening and he just put my name for it. And that's how I got in. So like I, and I barely even talked to this guy after that recording session. Like we were friendly Mm -hmm. at the beginning when we first met each other. And like, but then like fast forward, like two to three years, we barely kept in contact and he just remembered me. And that's how I got in. Really cool. Do you feel like, like it was a, a lightning in the bottle kind of scenario? Like, like if you think about like hearing like, like the equivalent parallel for, for bands would be you play that one show and a record executive just happens to be in the audience and happens right. to listen to your music and, and then they put your name forward and it's just kind of like a coincidental happenstance kind of thing, right? Like, do you feel like that you hit that lightning in the bottle? In, in terms of me getting into the ad industry, I think for sure. I mean, not, not to, I don't know how to say this without sounding a little bit insensitive, but a man actually like literally died. And that's yeah. how I got this job. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like people don't really give up in-house composer positions. They don't really like those, those are so rare. Um, yeah, at least in Toronto, they are. Um, it's very much a freelance game. Right. So right. for something that's more longitudinal, like you, you were writing, um, uh, guitar tracks and recording guitar tracks for DreamWorks' uh, Dragons, right? And that's yes. that's kind of a, a like the, it's episodic, like there's multiple episodes. So do they have like an in-house team for that specific project or they still bring on freelancers? Yeah, so that, um, I mean, yeah, music is music for film is almost always freelance, right? Um, so the way I got that was... Um, uh, I had a friend, a really close friend that I made in my master's program in Chicago. Um, she moved to LA and stayed in LA. Um, she got hired as an additional writer by the main writer who is writing music for DreamWorks Dragons. Um, so she was part of the music team. Um, and that, that team is just hired on a case by case basis. Like they do that one season and then that's it. And they probably need to like get in again, but they'll probably if they're interested, they'll probably get in for the second season, you know? Right. But, um, anyway, so she was an additional writer. And so, uh, they had a budget for live musicians and they need a guitar for a handful of tracks for a handful of episodes. And so she would call me. And so I would be in my studio, um, in Toronto, just, uh, she would send me the music, send me the, the session, the pro tool session. I just sit there and record the guitar parts and send them back to her. She mixes them and then it ends up on the show. That's right. really cool. So yeah, th- this is another question of it. I've just been dying to ask you. So let's say like, for example, like this episode, they kind of sent you like a template with a bunch of maybe other instruments and you're kind of writing your guitar for that part. But let's say like you, you get into, you get a gig writing a music for like craft dinner commercial or something. Which I have done. Which you have done. <laughs> yeah. So what what does that conversation even look like? Do they provide you a bunch of examples of other music out there that they kind of like the feel of it? Or yeah. do they say, do they give you like a finished episode and and you look at that 30 second clip and then start writing? Or do you just give them like, here's three different things I came up with? Like, what do you even do? So it's kind of all of that. Um, so pretty much, uh, we'll, we'll take that craft dinner ad, for example, that was yeah. a really fun one to do. Um, <laughs> so they usually, the ad, um, actually it was funny for that one. They had an animation of the ad, so it wasn't even shot yet. They just had some sort of like, Anna, like a hand drawn animation or, or whatever it was, but yeah, like an animation, it wasn't live yeah. action. Um, but, uh, so they like kind of mocked it. It was kind of like a really nice looking storyboard kind of. Right. Um, and so it was uh, blocked out like that. And then they, um, so they give you that to work with. Like it's, it's actually sometimes in ads, you write music without picture, but almost all, all of the time, they'll have the ad for you to write music too. So you can hit right. all the different moments. Right. Um, and so, and yeah, oftentimes like 99% of the time, they will give you a list of uh, tracks that they already like that they think would fit the vibe. Okay, um, cool. when you're working for an audio production company, um, 
it's their job to work with the advertising agency to come up with that vibe too. So a lot of times my music references would come from like the company I'm working for, not necessarily that agency. But uh, for that one, I think the reference was um, Joan Jett. Um, Right. The reputation, that song. Um, So, uh, yeah. So you you take that reference and um, oftentimes the references they give you aren't perfect. Sometimes it'd be like, oh, we really love this one little piece of this track and we really like this vibe on this other track. And you kind of have to just digest all of that and come up with something that kind of represents what they're actually going for. Right. Yeah. Do you ever, uh, just for shits and giggles, like by yourself, do you ever <laughs> like take that that craft dinner ad that that kind of storyboard and put like scary music to it just to see how, <laughs> how <laughs> I I don't normally like write original music for that gag but oftentimes like me and my my other colleagues my the other composers for a gag yeah we'd often put some ridiculous music onto it like that's for, awesome like, like for Benny Ford. Hill music or something yeah <laughs> or like for um for all the Ford truck commercials we got a ton of Ford truck commercials. Um, cause the company I was working for had an exclusive contract with, uh, Ford. Um, yeah. and, uh, sometimes for shits and giggles, we would throw up some like ridiculous, like thrash metal onto it or something. <laughs> and it was just awesome. That's awesome. Because Ford truck commercials, they always have, um, like heavily distorted guitars. Yeah. They have, um, very kind of like Tom drums and, and snare drums in it. Like they're kind of, they're very like formulaic, aren't they? Yeah, they, they, they were for a while. Um, it, 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 like I've no other way of describing it other than just truck rock. It's just, truck. it's like, it's, it's its own thing. <laughs> it's a genre know? in and of itself. Yeah. It was heavily, heavily inspired by like, um, black keys, like the black right. keys. Like there was like, well, actually what was funny is that when I got a job as an in-house ad music composer, the first one I landed was a Ford F-150 commercial. And, um, nice was i i I don't know i i guess i had an advantage because i play guitar or whatever and grew up playing tons of rock but um somehow i just cracked the code because i won almost every single ford f-150 commercial in canada for like two years straight so it was it was crazy like it was it was mind-blowing if i didn't win one it was like such a shock um (laughs) so it definitely there definitely was a formula too and i just somehow cracked it i knew what they wanted um, and at the beginning it was like lots of octave fuzz, like, yeah, there was probably like six guitar parts, even though it sounded like maybe just two massive ones, you know what I mean? Like it was just like, just to make it really broad and, and hit yeah. really hard. Right. Yeah. Do you have your guitar on you? Could you play us like a, yeah. like a Ford F-150 guitar ad? So actually what's interesting is my favorite version of the Ford F-150 is when we started pushing it into a slightly different direction. Like they ended up toning it down on the overt fuzz rock stuff, right. the truck rock. And they started making it a little bit more. Yeah, actually what's funny. Is so black keys stopped being the reference and it moved more towards Tame Impala. Interesting. So, yeah. And then it started becoming, it kind of did this kind of hybrid thing. So I actually, some of the later Ford F-150 commercials I did actually had some cool, like gritty synths in it too, but uh, nice. There was one I did for this uh, this commercial where they're uh, talking about a new boat. These two guys are in a locker room, and he's like, "Oh, I got a new boat." And he's like, "Oh, you gotta get a truck so you can tow your boat." It's just like it's so funny. But uh, so I started off actually with acoustic. I think I'm like. <laughs> Sometimes there's a little four tag. Yeah. <laughs> right. Amazing. Ford F-150. Built Ford tough. Yeah. And then the big plate drops on. Exactly. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's like this swampy sort of, it sounds better with distortion, obviously, but um, yeah. it's very riff oriented. You have to come up with these really catchy riffs. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of like catchy and bouncy, but, gritty and swampy too you know what i mean they that's actually a really good way to describe it like when, when you play it on acoustic 
I I immediately just put it in distortion, and it just yeah, yeah. sounds like a Ford commercial. Like I it, mm-hmm. I can tell right away. Um, but it does sound a little, you're right, like bouncy and yeah. like, it's actually a cool riff. Yeah. Like a little nice bit riff. of swagger. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. got, it's got some swag to it. I like mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So, um, like what's your favorite brand to write for? Is it Ford or? Uh, surprisingly, no. I mean, I, <laughs> I liked those cause they were easy for me, but like, you know, it's, right. it gets a little bit boring after a while. Um, so I, I didn't love doing those towards the end, but, um, I'm trying to think of what my favorite was. One of the favorite ones I ever did was for, uh, Lincoln, okay. um, <laughs> which is Ford, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, uh, Lincoln was fun. Um, Lincoln was a total mess at the beginning because as a brand, they didn't know where they fit in the luxury car market. Okay. Cause they're competing with like Audi and Mercedes and BMW and Lincoln was just kind of this weird, like no one was really buying Lincoln at the time. Right. Um, but eventually with enough like trial and error, they landed on this really cool, um, sort of like jazzy trip hoppy, slightly experimental type of sound, which worked well for them. Um, so that was really fun to do. Um, you know, luxury brands were always really fun to write music for because you could right. like just get really, like really like sexy with it. Like for lack of a, I don't know what right. else to describe it. Just like, just like very like, like I would always record myself doing these like exhales, like, <sighs> like just like <laughs> at the little transitions and stuff like that. It was just, it was just fun to like add that like polish and that shine on top of it. Um, I love how yeah. you're <laughs> saying that like a, f- an, a sexy exhale is polish and shine. That's amazing. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Do you ever lay down those tracks and you're just going ah, into the mic and you're like, what, what am I doing with my life? Yes. <laughs> like, am I a porn producer or yep. <laughs> am I a guitarist? <laughs> yeah. It's what's actually what's funny is one of my favorite moments in film music. And you're going to laugh because it's ridiculous is um, Tomb Raider with Angelina Jolie. Back in like 2002, I'm like 12 at the time watching Tomb Raider. And the very first scene, she's like fighting that robot. And there's this one part where she um, pits her back up against the, this pillar. And that's when she like loads her guns for the first time. Like she, she wastes her clips, right? And she loads her guns and she like looks over her shoulder at the, around to the robot. Right. And just the music all kind of ducks out. And then there's like two or three layers of voices um, a girl and a guy, and they're just kind of moaning. They go like, uh, uh, and there's like some, probably some exhales in there. And it's just like the perfect, just drop it. It just goes like, and it just drops and like has this like perfect, like exhale moan moment. And it was awesome. A, a lot of really high impact uh, work is knowing where not to put music. Yeah. Like for example, even if you're playing guitar and you're just soloing nonstop and really, really, really fast notes and hammer-ons and pull-offs and you're obviously like showing off prog rock style, yeah. kind of shredding, um, but you kind of lose like a cadence and, and a rhythm and like phrasing. And humans are very well known to like, we like that kind of um, the feel of, of like phrasing because we, we talk to each other and that's how, how speech is, kind yeah. of ebbs and flows and comes in and out. And I think that some of the most impactful, um, like music for, for film or, you know, commercials or anything like that is, is knowing when to kind of relax and, and sit back and just kind of let the dialogue do the work or let, let someone's face, like if they're contemplating something and they're kind of deep in thought, kind of just letting that sit with, with, uh, the person that's watching it and not kind of, you know, blowing it up with a bunch of big guitar riffs and big music and stuff like that. For sure. Yeah. Those are always the funnest parts to do like that, that little drop right before it kind of like kicks right back in. Um, yeah. and in the case of like something more action oriented or uh, something more upbeat, that drop back in, like that is the funnest part of a track for me to compose, like doing that little, like fill right into the drop. Those right. It's really fun. Yeah. So what's when you're, when you're writing, so for example, guitar for, um, like a, a luxury brand versus, uh, like Ford or like Toyota or, you know, something like that. Like what, what's your, what's your process for writing something to 
to kind of hit those, those different brand images, I guess. Right. Yeah. So, um, like I said before, it, it depends on the, um, uh, what's the word? The, uh, like the thing, the project at the time, um, mm-hmm. like the ad campaign. Sorry, that's what I was looking for the campaign, um, which can change quite drastically even within one brand. Um, but usually like when you're doing ads full time, you do the same brands over and over and over again. So you kind of get a feel for what that brand is about. And, um, especially when I'm first, um, approaching a brand, I always do a bunch of research on the brand, um, just outside of work, just to, um, just get a feel as, as best I can for kind of what they want to represent. Um, so you always just follow those cues, right? So like, for example, Ford, Ford trucks are very interesting because for the longest time there was Ford and then there was Ford trucks, like Ford trucks were like a separate, like tough thing. Like it had its own logo. It had its own thing. Right. Um, like for example, the, um, its own slogan too. Build exactly. Ford tough. Exactly. Right. Like for any of the other Ford cars, there was that mnemonic like it's called the little stinger at the end of every single commercial that went right um right. just a and, little like earworm that that's recognizable yeah. to that like a little jingle right exactly right and so the ford trucks though they never used that um but then eventually they started rebranding and they wanted more like regular people to go out and buy ford trucks so they started right. making it less of that blatant rock thing um and then and they added that tag at the end of the Ford truck commercials too right um so that's kind of like that's an example of how the vibe shifted but um oh, sorry did did you come up with that that stinger at the end like is that no you? I didn't know oh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that's been around for way before I even started composing um whoever did write that tag probably has quite a bit of money in their bank but um <laughs> So I was going to ask you what the hardest part about writing guitar for someone else's vision is because, um, it, as a, like either a, a solo artist or when you're in a band, uh, you're kind of in charge of that. Right. Yep. And you don't have someone on the other end saying, no, we can't do that. Or, you know, it just doesn't fit. So what's, what's the iterative process like, like regardless of who you're working with, whether it's film or tv or you know video games you've done video games in the past what's the iterative process like like how many times you go back and forth and do revisions and right uh so with advertising the revisions are like that is a huge part of the job um like like it's you have 15 or actually now with um tiktok and instagram sometimes the advertising is only six seconds Right. So it's like anywhere between six and 30 seconds, which is such a ridiculously small amount of time to um, present all of the information and all of the vibe and all of the feel that they mm-hmm. need to present. So it's it's very meticulous for these advertising agencies. So like there's plenty of revisions. I usually have to do at least like two rounds of revisions. Um, some brands are a lot more picky than others. There's sometimes it goes up to like six or eight revisions. Wow. Um, sometimes they do eight revisions and decide to scrap the whole thing and you have to start fresh. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, revisions are definitely a thing. Um, do you get compensated for all those revisions? Like yeah. your, your time based on those? Yeah. yeah. So um, you mentioned that, that sometimes they'll just scrap it. Yeah. So uh, how often does your work just straight up get rejected? And does that f- feel bad uh so rejections happen all the time because like the way it works uh is um like the advertising agency will go to a music production house um like let's say pirate for example they're a huge one in toronto um whatever that that producer or pirate will have their own list of writers they'll reach out to like i don't know between four and eight of them and you'll write a track and um you get paid a demo fee, which is great. So no matter what, if I write music, I'm getting paid. Um, but then if the ad agency chooses the track that you wrote to go on the, the final product, then you get paid even more money, right? So right. most of the time you're getting rejected. Most of the time, the tracks you write do not end up anywhere. Um, if you're lucky, 
you can repurpose that track for something else, which has happened okay. plenty of times. They allowed you to do that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so that, that happens all the time. That's like an archive track or like a dead track. Um, and that will sometimes be pitched on something else. Um, Interesting. Yeah, most of the time it's a rejection. What's what's your mental behind that? Like if it is, let's say like 80% of the time, you know, they, they don't end up using it and they use someone else's work. Like how do you... How do you rationalize that um, and and not get into your head? Be like, I'm you know, I'm not I'm not getting it, or I'm not I'm not picking up what they're putting down. Um, like, do you? Yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I wrote like I wrote ads like full time for like three years, so where I, like all I was doing almost was just advertisements, which of course just very quick turnaround. I was doing like two tracks a day for like three years. Um, and so I don't know, you just get used to the rejection. I mean, at the very beginning when I was fresh, um, it took me a while to kind of get in the groove. Um, so I was getting like rejected almost like all the time for like six months. Like I didn't land yeah. anything for a while. Um, but, uh, so in that period, definitely I was getting in my own head, like wondering when it's going to get going, um, feeling a little bit down, but um, yeah. you do have to kind of just trust the process. Cause even when you get going, like, you know, I, I was in an in-house situation. So there's three other writers in addition to me. Um, we all kind of just had our strides. We all had our, um, our streaks and we all had losing periods too. Like, I think my longest streak was maybe nine months where I was winning at least one ad, um, for like nine months straight. Um, nice. But then, you know, you could easily go three, four months without winning anything. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone kind of gets their turn. It's just this natural thing. It, it all kind of just works out in the end. So you have yeah, to trust in really, the average. Kinda. Really, uh, really healthy way to look at it. Yeah. Um, I feel like like us as humans, like when we're getting feedback from people, like even if you get nine points of good feedback and you have one point of bad feedback, we really focus mm -hmm. on on that negative yeah. Um, and, and that kind of trumps all the good things that kind of happen. So I think that's a really, really healthy kind of mental outlook. Yeah. You on, have to stop viewing rejection. it as a negative, right? Like if it's, um, especially just in case, in terms of revision notes or revisions, it's like, they're the boss. Like it's, it's their commercial, it's their film, it's their video game. Like they have the ultimate creative vision for it. Right. So right. you're, you're not like, yeah, like you said, you're not a solo artist. You're not in your own band. You're serving this bigger team, this bigger product, this, this vision. Right. right. Um, so, you know, usually if you're working with a director or a video game producer that you really trust, um, who knows their stuff, like you just like almost every single time I've had to drastically change something for a film or a video game, it ends up being way better in the end. Even at, even if I'm dragging my feet at first, I'm like, oh, I liked it. Like, why don't they just like my original idea? It was brilliant, right? right? But then, you know, they have a good reason for um, giving those revisions. In advertising, yeah. sometimes it's not that way. Because <laughs> there's just, <laughs> unfortunately with ads, there's just so many people involved. It's like, you're not just listening to the advertising agency. They, they have a creative vision. But then the boss at the actual brand, like Ford, might just have some weird bias against like an instrument, even just like a single instrument, be like, yeah, this music's terrible because I hate bassoons or something. Right. And right. it's like, they're not even really listening to the vibe or the function. They just hear that one timbre and they're like, no. Right. So it's, there's a lot of like silly politics involved in advertising. So it's not always the case that their revisions are good, but right. when you're working with like a good director or a video game or something like that, it's, it's usually for the better. Nice. Would you, would you recommend, a guitarist to get into your line of work, like as an alternative dream or a career path to the whole rock star thing. Right. Um, yeah, it, it really just depends on their interests. Right. Because like when I started getting into composition, I had less time for just like pure guitar skill development. Right. Right. So like I still get to play, I still record guitar any chance I get like for whatever 
project, whatever commercial, like if, if guitar fits the vibe, I'll try to record guitar, but right. it's like, it's nowhere near the same as where guitar performances, you're like, you're one thing. Right. right. Um, like I'm nowhere near as good at guitar as let's say some of my jazz buddies from school who only do guitar. Right. Cause right. I like, and also I, I have to play a bunch of different instruments. Right. Um, the more live instruments you can play is usually the better when you're doing like stuff for media, just cause it's uh live performances just give quite a bit of a boost. Better feel. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, like, you know, I, I don't really love this saying the whole like Jack of all trades, like master of none type master thing. Master of none. Yeah. I, I don't, that before too. I find that very negative, but there is some truth to that. Like I'm not just a guitar player. So therefore I'm not as good as someone who is just a guitar player. Right. Mm. So if there's like a guitarist out there listening to this and they're thinking about this, like it, it just depends on what you're interested in. Like you have to, this isn't really like a plan B because I didn't become a rock star. It's like, like this is a whole different profession and art form in and of itself that has all these little intricate things going on. So, and you have to get good at that in and of itself. Right. So it's also, it's almost just as competitive and hard as being a rock star. So, right. <laughs> so it's, it's yeah, not really, that's like, why I was asking about, about networking, yeah. like knowing the right people to kind of get, get those spots and placements. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think is, uh, is pretty important. Um, cool. Um, another question that I, I really wanted to ask and kind of more like in the mental headspace, um, cause th that's so important in music, uh, when you're writing, um, you are kind of behind the scenes in everything versus someone yep. that, you know, is taking the rock star path. Yep. Right. Um, when you write something for, you know, film, your name is in the credits, but people don't necessarily know John Hagley when, yeah. when they listen to your music, um, even though it's fantastic music. So what, what's your, does that bother you at all? Like what, what's your mental yeah. behind that? Yeah. That's uh, especially the beginning. That is extremely difficult to wrap your head around. Um, it's still difficult. Depends on the day you just be having a bad day or whatever. It's yeah, that, that is tough, especially as someone who started as an instrumentalist and Trust me, I definitely wanted to be a rock star. Right? I at least wanted to be a, tr a, um, a touring musician or like a studio musician or something. Like I, I wanted guitar to be my thing. Um, but then I just, you know, I just naturally fell into composition because I was just interested in so many different genres. So actually, I was never like amazing in one genre from the start. Like I would have kid, like buddies who only ever played rock and they were way better at rock than I was because I wasn't interested mm -hmm. in only playing rock, right? But uh, yeah, anyways, the the behind the scenes thing that that hurts. It, it just uh, like I'm not gonna lie that that's hard to deal with, especially in advertising, because in advertising, no one knows who you are at all. Because right. if if on Instagram the ad agency decides to maybe put credits down, <laughs> Pirate Toronto is getting the credit, not John right. Hagley, right? The music right. production house is getting the credit, not John. Right. So that, that can be kind of frustrating at first, but like it is what it is. It's uh, f film is better. At least you get that screen credit. Like you said, right. Like everyone yeah, does right. know who Hans Zimmer is. Right. That's right. For sure. And, and video games too. Video exactly. games have credits as well. Yeah. Like video yeah. game music is huge and everyone. What was your experience? Cause you did, you did the game Scully. Yep. And it came out on what PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. Switch, right? Yeah, and PC. Um, was there a PC? There was PC yep. as well. Yeah. Um, I, I had never played the game, but I checked out um trailers of the game because I wanted to listen to your music. Cool. Obviously. Um, really cool music and kind of cool vibe and very different from from other stuff that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, what was it like working in the video game industry? Yeah. I mean, that's where I would love to spend like all my time. If it was up to me, I would really focus entirely on video games because, uh, like I was addicted to games growing up. Like that was like my number one passion. Like what was funny is even when I went to my, um, my uh, screen composing masters in Chicago, all of my, uh, fellow students and colleagues, they're all having these long in depth discussions about their favorite movie scores and that movie they saw when they're however old that totally turned them to want to uh, be film composers. 
Yeah. And I was sitting there and I was like, I am so behind in this conversation because all of my inspiration came from video games. Like That's I sweet, wanted, to, I wanted to be a video game composer um, when I was in school. Like that was, and that still is like my number one. If I, if I had to write music for media, video games is my number one. Um, cool. And why is that? The, the music is absolutely incredible in video games. And it's so complex too, because it's not, um, you know, it's uh, watching a movie is somewhat of a passive experience. Whereas in a game, it's an active experience. And oftentimes, especially right. these days with modern games, the music is reacting to your input, right? right. The whole environment is reacting, right? So it's um, very, very complex systems that are built um, to implement the music in that way. Um, so, so do, that's do you record, so for example, yeah, if it is reactive, that's really interesting. And something that I had not really thought about before, because video games in the past were very linear. You, yep. you sit down, you watch some cutscenes, and then you play through the yep. one linear path that you have and you're golden. And it was probably much easier to write music for video games back then because, you know, yep. there's one path and you go ahead, but your, your thought about it reacting to you. So do you write music for different situations that could yeah. happen in the game or kind of different like emotions that the main character or the emotion that you want the person playing the game to, to kind of evoke, mm -hmm. do you write all those and then kind of they crossfade those tracks together? Like how pretty how much like work? in it, in it, that's, that's a pretty simple description of it, but that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the, one of the most uh, simple ways of doing it is like, um, yeah, that crossfade thing you said. So there'll be like, uh, let's say you're playing an RPG. Uh, you're like this, like, mage or something you're walking around this open medieval world um so when you're just walking around it might just be this kind of like cool pastoral uh adventurous music but not not really too upbeat it's just kind of like background soundtrack kind of stuff to keep you immersed um, i'm thinking zelda breath of the wild there you go i'm, right, I'm so. walking around hyrule field right now i got a sword in my hand shield on my back yeah let's go exactly right but then as soon as you see a camp an enemy camp maybe you start hearing some other music kind of creep in you just hear john moaning oh. exactly <laughs> <laughs> the exhales and the moans exactly and then you get closer to that camp and you start hearing maybe at first you just hear some percussion come in right on top of the right. other pastoral music you're already hearing you're hearing this other percussion layer come in and then once you start fighting it kind of cross fades into this other thing right right yeah that's really cool do you are there other stringed instruments that you use other than guitar for video games like i'm thinking like i've heard a lot of like mandolins and and banjos yeah. in certain games yeah. um especially for like you talked about kind of open world like your yeah. pasture kind of like running through it and i hear a lot of that kind of style of music mm -hmm. um like kind of folksy kind yeah of like stuff. medieval folk kind of stuff yeah. totally like i'm thinking of yeah. the witcher the witcher three years the witcher yeah, yeah totally yeah so do you have um like different stringed instruments that you use so i wish i had a mandolin i do not have one yet um pretty much for stringed instruments like live ones i have multiple guitars um and i have like a ukulele um anything else is um like sampled or uh done with uh like sample library instruments um or right. that's when you call up a friend and hire them to play on your your track right. um but uh yeah no a mandolin is definitely something on my list to uh to uh, get nice oh man okay another question uh, that i have for you man i have so many questions for you okay so when you're recording something that is super high end professional quality, like you're writing for a video game or you're writing for like even DreamWorks is dragons mm -hmm. when they gave you that, the, the file and you just tracked into it and, and recorded your guitar into it. Are you recording this like in your apartment flat uh, or, or like house with like, do you have a studio in your house? Like how do you keep, yeah, so I'm in my apartment right now, and uh, you can see right behind me, I have these like really thick, like three inch acoustic panels. Yeah. Um. So I got these during the pandemic, um, because I had to move everything here. Um, definitely not as ideal as my last studio. Um, but so I, I have recorded some stuff 
for, um, I don't think it was DreamWorks Dragons, but I've recorded some guitar for other composers for um, film in this apartment. Um, That's so cool. That, yeah, that it wasn't that bad. That level of sound uh, just kind of in your place. Yeah. You know, it really removes that, that barrier to entry, uh, yeah. which I really like. Yeah. You don't need to like, be in like a pro studio kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's really cool. Like um, just the way that that tech is going, that we have this equipment that's kind of available for everyone. That's relatively cheap. Like yeah. for, for someone that wanted to record their guitar tracks in their, in their bedroom or, you know, basement or something like that. Like how cheap do you think that they can put some, and like, what, what would you need? Just like bare bones, beginner kind of like mini studio. Right. Um, okay. Well, I would. Okay. So let's, let's see. So your, your recording software is going to cost some money. Um, that ranges wildly, but I, well, actually, no, here's a good answer. Okay. So if you already have a Mac, if you have a Mac computer, the best choice is probably logic because it's like 200 bucks pay for it once lifetime updates and it comes with like tons of like software instruments and all this stuff and logic's great um so that's 200 bucks right there if you don't have a mac or if you don't even have the 200 dollars, there is a program called reaper and reaper has like a fanatic community around it and um reaper is like a newer daw that was uh developed by i think just two people so it is extremely efficient because all the code is just like very new, very streamlined. And um, uh, that DAW, it's technically... DAW six- is a digital audio workstation. It's just like recording yes, software, exactly. basically. Um, but so Reaper is, for uh, individual licenses, like $60. Technically, though, they have a free trial that never ends. So... <laughs> I do know people that just do the trial and just never end the trial. And it's a fully functional trial. Um, So technically, if you wanted to, you could get Reaper for free um, and just use that as your recording DAW. Um, And it's it's just as professional as anything else. Um, And then uh, let's see, you would need a microphone. Um, I mean, you can get a lot done with a Shure SM57. Um, that's right. It's a good versatile. That's instrument like a hundred dollar mic. Yeah. Um, if what you, are your thoughts on um, like speaking about microphones and kind of like home thrown together recording setups? What are your thoughts on plugging your guitar directly into your computer? So with a digital audio interface mm-hmm. versus plugging your guitar into an amp and then putting a mic on that amp. Right. Um, the problem with miking an amp is you've just upped the complexity um, mm. and you've just upped uh, the equipment required. And uh, the problem with that, like when I was doing music for ads, especially, I did not mic a single amp. There's no way, no way I was going to do that because um, if you're on the eighth revision, like you got to recall that amp setting like eight times now and make sure it's like perfect. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So like person, take a picture of where all the knobs are at, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. It was just, there's no way. And sometimes, you know, um, that track gets rejected. Then it gets pitched on something completely different a year later. And then they want revision notes a year later. Right. So then wow. you certainly need to make sure you took a picture of the amp and it's, it's almost impossible to get it like perfect. Um, there's one time where I, uh, one time I was, so I was using a software amp, which I used exclusively. I pretty much always use software amps. Um, I forgot to write down, uh, like the level in my audio interface, like the, the first line in level. Right. Um, Mm. so I had to kind of like, I got it close enough and then i had to literally look at the waveform support and i had to punch something in i had to punch in in the middle of my guitar riff i had to look at that and just like match the waveforms visually and oh, it turned no. it turned out okay with just crossfading and stuff but yeah, yeah. but uh, anyways to answer your question i think if you're doing a electric guitar um you can definitely plug into your interface and um there's so many good guitar amp software guitar amps available and if you just like know how to gain stage properly which is like a 10 second Google search, especially in relation to just recording a software amp. It's, Mm -hmm. it's great. Like the, the technology is so good these days that, um, so an audio interface, like 
you can get a decently cheap one, definitely less than a hundred bucks for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, they range and you, you definitely get what you pay for though. Um, so, uh, like I use Apogee interfaces, which are a little bit more on the higher end. Um, still affordable though. I mean, you can get, um, they, they have a range. They definitely have a range, right? Um, but yeah, you can get these. Uh, there's uh, an interface company called Audient that are very affordable, that are very high quality, very good value. So yeah, you could probably get a, a really good interface for around 100 or 200 bucks. Um, I would probably budget like $200 at least. Um, um, so yeah, let's say you, you got your DAW. You, you get like maybe Logic for 200 bucks or maybe Reaper for $60 or for free. Um, right. you get an interface for maybe $200 or something. Um, you can get a lot done with that. Sure. Some 57, like I said, for a hundred bucks. Um, you can maybe stretch it to 200 bucks and get an audio technica condenser microphone. Um, it's pretty much it. So like 500 <laughs> bucks and yeah. you too can record a Ford commercial. Yep, exactly. And nice. then just a pair of headphones, right? You don't a even need studio yeah, monitors at first. And you know, for a lot of beginners who are in the corner of their bedroom or something, studio monitors will probably sound like crap anyway, because your yeah, room will they not need to be, be treated. pointed and arranged correctly yeah. to really sound great. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, if you don't have treatment like this to kind of control that sound, it's you can't even really trust the sound coming out of them anyway. So you're better off with headphones. Yeah. Headphones. There you go. Yep. Um, so, John, what's your favorite part about your job? Uh, I mean, my favorite part is just being able to be creative, um, and getting different. I, I like, I like the uh, variation. So especially in ads, like the, the turnaround, like I said, I was writing like two tracks a day for like three years. Um, those were like wildly different genres and different advertisements. Right. So like for me, like having an interest in so many different music genres, um, and instruments and all that kind of stuff. Um, that was like, that was incredible for me that I got to like, and I got to learn so much stuff. Like what's great about, um, being in music is that you never stop learning either. You're just like yeah. constantly getting better and better and better and learning new stuff and new music is always coming out and you're always listening to new music and like just developing and yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, it's nice. just a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and obviously no job is, is complete without, you know, some bad times. Yeah. Um, so is there a time that, that you felt that you like really bombed or like were embarrassed of something or like just negative aspects? Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. The, like the hardest, the single hardest part about being in music, whether, whether you're playing guitar as your own thing, as an artist or in a band or doing composition like me, um, the income is just so inconsistent. Um, right. that's, that's probably the single most challenging thing about it. Um, you are going to be freelance for like your entire life. Like even Hans Zimmer is technically freelance. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it's just kind of, you're going from gig to gig. You have to be really careful with, uh, your money. Um, there's, you know, some months you'll make barely nothing. And then another month you might land a bunch of stuff and make like 10 to 15 grand as an example, right? Like it's just, but you have to take that and like, you have to think of the big picture and average it out over the year. Um, so that is super challenging. Um, another thing that's challenging specifically with composition is um, turning your creativity on all the time. Right. Um, if you're writing what you said, two tracks a day in that kind of nine month period, we were on that streak. Yeah. That's like, you have to wake up and write two good solid riffs a day. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tricky. And sometimes it's, it's not always there, but I mean, you have to trust your experience. Like if you're writing that much music all the time, you're just going to get good. No matter, even you can try your hardest to not get good and you're still going to get good. <laughs> like you will just um, automatically get good if you're writing that much music. Um, so even on your bad days, you have to trust that it's still going to be a viable product. Um, right. may have been a little frustrating to get there. You might be tired. You might not even believe in it that much, but, um, you just have to trust in your experience, but that, that is tricky right. though. It's, it's, you know, 
you're having a bad day, you're really tired, you're, I mean, hell, you could even just be depressed that day. And then you get a commercial that's supposed to be all peppy and happy and shit, and you're just not feeling it. And, right. you know, you know it's, it's, it is hard sometimes. Um, so for, for beginner guitarists, um, do you have any, like, what would you recommend to a beginner guitarist that wanted to get into your line of work? Like what path do you take? Yeah. So, um, well, they're already got a good start by choosing an instrument that they like. Um, yeah. guitar is awesome. I like, I love guitar. Um, a lot of composers, uh, grew up playing piano. Um, which is great too. That's super versatile, but I find that guitar is also like just as versatile and just like, it's just awesome. I I feel like you can pick guitar into almost like every vibe and every genre and it's just like so good. So picking guitar is great. Um, just like get as good as you can at guitar, but, um, learn as many different genres as possible because you cannot play rock your whole life and then expect to do composition. And then all of a sudden they're asking for like jazz and you're just like, ACDC. Sorry, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's like the jazziest thing they ever played was that that one jazz track that uh, Randy Bachman did. <laughs> I forget, I'm right. kind of blanking on the the name, but there's like this uh, one jazzier track he did with the Guess Who. Um, but you know what I mean? Like that doesn't cut it. Like you have to you have to at least be willing to explore like every genre imaginable, um, mm-hmm. and you just have to be a quick learner. You just have to be excited to learn new things. That's yeah. pretty much the best advice I can give you. Like just explore, explore everything you can. Um, even, you know, when I was playing guitar, I had a piano growing up in my home. So I would play piano as well. Just, I never took formal lessons on piano. I took formal lessons on guitar, but then I just kind of like played around and tried to learn songs on piano. So just staying like exploratory and hungry and um, yeah, that's probably the best advice. Yeah, I think I think your your thoughts on on genre and just kind of exploring is really important. Like that's how you learn so many different skills and and like rhythms and and different fundamentals playing guitar yeah. um that you wouldn't have otherwise had if you're just playing power chords in rock yeah. music for example, right? Yeah. Um and and even like delving into pop. Like I had never really played pop songs. Um and then a bunch of our arrangers at AI Music Lessons pumped out a bunch of like Dua Lipa and, yeah. and like Lord and, yeah. and even Backstreet Boys we have on there. Yeah. And, and I was playing along with it and I was like, damn, this is actually a really fun riff. Um, yeah. Backstreet but, Boys you know, has incredible guitar in it, actually. Like, I know, right? Really good guitar. <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. And if you kind of pigeonhole yourself into like, I only play Metallica and, and you know, other metal you really lose out on, on that kind of stuff. And you know what, if you have roommates that can't accept that you're playing Backstreet Boys on your guitar, put on earphones, yep. you know, it's cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they should though. I mean, like, honestly, I, I never understood, uh, the guitarists or musicians that just, just totally just like turn their nose up to certain genres. I'm like, you're not listening you're like clearly not actually listening because if you listen to like Braxtree Boys or any nineties pop, that was when like the Latin influence was huge. And there's like yeah. incredible, like nylon string Spanish guitar solos and like all these yeah. Backstreet Boys songs. And it's like the musicianship and the production is amazing. And so there's many a of really good um, nylon guitar solo in uh, Savage Garden. Yes. Do you know the song I'm talking about? It just stops and then there's this like big front center. I can't, uh, I don't know the title, but yeah. 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 And you're right. Like that was like early 2000s, late, late nineties pop. It was super good. Yep. Yeah. Um, So kind of wrapping up here, um, do you have any like tips or uh, tips and tricks for beginner guitarists um, that you might want that in your experience as a guitarist that you might want to say? to someone that's learning? Hmm. Um, I would say like try to learn as much, as many songs as you can. Like, just like, like I said before, like with the composition advice, like stay hungry and just like really search for stuff to learn. Like even if you are getting formal lessons and you're working on a specific song with your teacher, like go and learn a bunch of other stuff too, like on your own. Right. Um, 
that that would be huge advice i would say um i would also say like oh you know what sorry i okay i have one bit of advice that's probably like the number one it's a little bit hard right now because of the pandemic but join a band yeah number one advice actually that that probably had the biggest impact on my development was having friends that i could jam with um like i played with um i started playing when i was 12 and then by the time i was 13 i had a group of really close friends who all decided to um play uh play music and kind of like jam together and um we all were learning together we were all beginners right like they literally said i'm gonna go and see if my parents will sign me up from drum lessons and then so the guys like oh i'll go do that for bass like i was the only one who started a little bit ahead of time um and i played with those guys all through middle school all through high school even when we went off to university we would come back on uh break and play together and that was like that skyrocketed my development like playing in time playing with other people just like my listening totally. skills, like that, that's probably the number one thing I would say. Find someone to that's play with. That's what happened with um, with Kings of Leon. Like when they when they got signed, the the one guy knew how to play guitar, but he didn't. So he, I believe, he enlisted his brothers, and they were drums and and bass, but they didn't know how to play. Um, so what the record company did, they really believed in these guys and invested in them, and they said, "All right, we're going to give you a month." go back to your hometowns, learn how to play drums, learn how to play bass. Here's a box set to Led Zeppelin. Nice. And they said that they just smoked a lot of weed, listened to Led Zeppelin, and he tried to learn bass and drums. That's awesome. (laughs) Isn't that insane? That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, So talking about... um, a band joining a band. I remember like back in school, I would just go look for people that played music and say, yep. you know, you want to start something up, but especially now in the pandemic where, you know, it's kind of harder to do in-person stuff. Like where, where would you even go about finding a band? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that would definitely be hard in the pandemic. I think it's pretty much impossible to do in the pandemic until like stuff starts losing up. Like, um, like in Ontario, things aren't even loosened yet still like hundred um, percent. Yeah. So my first advice, let's say would be, the pandemic, let's say when the pandemic ends, yeah, yeah, like for if sure. you wanted to join a band, like where would you start? Uh, so depending on your age, like the, obviously the first place to start is just like your school, like yeah. whatever school you go to, just like, like you said, find people to play music. Um, if no one is interested in that in your school or you're out of school, um, sometimes you could even find flyers at, um, uh, music stores like even long McQuaid or something sometimes has like a bulletin board and people yeah, like will be looking for something like that. yeah something like that or um uh music schools or um a yeah, music uh, schools that's right yeah, yeah like even, even just like retail stores that have music school components i've even seen this at uh bookstores or record stores uh oh, record cool. stores actually often have um bulletin boards where some people are looking for musicians um there's facebook groups um for like musicians that want to like, and people often post like, Oh, I'm forming this band. I need a drummer or something. Um, Mm -hmm. so you can do it that way. Um, you know, and you know, if, if the luck doesn't go your way and you just are having a really hard time finding people you want to jam with, especially as a beginner, um, if you're having a hard time finding people, um, the next best thing would be to find like one person, (laughs) like at least even just like even another guitarist, to play even like a duo you can make great music together exactly like just finding like you gotta i'm sure there's like one other person you can find who either plays bass drums or guitar as well and you can kind of just like uh i like i used to jam with my brother all the time um bef- uh, even when i was in a band or even before i joined the band like he played guitar too so we would just kind of jam songs um, That's awesome. and then my other thing would be to like while you're waiting for a band or someone to jam with make sure you're like playing the songs you like on like Spotify or something. Right. Like a lot yeah. of like bedroom guitarists, sometimes they just like play in their own little world and they're never like holding themselves to any external like thing. Like, right. and oftentimes their timing is like really bad. So like if you're learning a song, eventually your goal should be to play it with your recording. In my opinion. I agree. That's what I always 100%. hold myself to play it with a backtrack or with a metronome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. 
Hey, well, uh, thanks a lot, John. Really appreciate it. You are a wealth of information, my friend. <laughs> Always enjoy talking to you. Um, I still have so many questions, but I think we're going to wrap it up there. Cool. Um, really, really interesting to dive into your world of, of video game music and TV and film. Uh, I think it's just fascinating, um, your story and how you got into it. So thanks a lot for cool. coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me.